It's Carlo Martinez de Salas, the editor-in-chief of um, uh, Mexico and Latin American Vogue, who is coming up. And with her is coming our speaker, Gabriella Hurst. So, uh, Gabriella, your, your story is pretty, um, is pretty amazing because you work out of New York, but you actually use your family's vast wool ranch in Uruguay, where you were brought up. So we're talking about a product from the country there coming to a very vibrant city. And what is so amazing and fascinating to me is not just that you have come so far, so quickly, in making clothes with a real purpose and a, and a deep feeling um, in New York and had a considerable financial success with them, but also that you've recently discovered that, um, that your family has a connection with um, Portuguese genes. So I hope you'll tell us this story and then we'll talk about your fashion. So you want to talk to about my, my genes, my Portuguese genes? I want to prove that you're whatever you told me, 71% Portuguese. Yes, <laughs> I usually, I used to think that I was 50% Portuguese and 50% Italian because my family has been in the south of Brazil and Brazil for, since the 1700s. But then they, I did Ancestry.com and you spit on the saliva and they give you the exact um, amount and I was 71% Portuguese. My mom is 99. So. Uh, and do you think this is going to change your whole way that you think of designing? Well, everything has influenced me. Um, growing up in Uruguay, which is a, a very small country of 3.5 million people, you have to go for quality and not, not quantity. And then also we have Europe as a cultural reference because 88% of the population is of European descent. And my background is Portuguese and Italian, 100% Latin. So, and then I plus that, you add the fact that I've been living in New York for 18 years and that, that gives me quite a, a global perspective and, and it also reflects in the company because over 50% of our sales are international. So I do think that all this together brings a, a specific uh, point of view that can talk to different cultures. Mm, absolutely. Um, and Carla Martinez de Salas, um, what do you think, what, what is, is it rather a surprise to you as well to realize that you've got somebody on, on your, um, who is so, connected to Portugal and to uh, the Latin world. Yes, I mean, when we, sp when we spoke on the phone a few months ago, I was very surprised to hear about um, Gabriela's background and being Portuguese. And I've actually never been to Uruguay, but listening to you speak about your history and how the country has influenced you, um, it being such a small country and how the, your family and how you've managed to keep that in your designs, I think is really interesting and amazing. Yes, the, when you grew up in a place like, like the one I grew up, which is basically more animals than people by a lot, and um, you grew up craving culture and, uh, and connection, uh, but also you learn certain values that are the, not only my love for materials, that we, my family was one of the first to bring Merino to Uruguay. So as you, you, you described, it took us a whole year and a half, but we shipped the Merino from Uruguay to Italy and then processed it and got it into other cloth for our suits and our different materials. So that, that was a great experience to combining both of my worlds. But also, you have a long-term view when you're a rancher and for six generations when you do the same thing, you, you work on long-term views and you build things with quality because they need to last because you're exposed to the elements. And um, so there is a, a love for quality that, that it's there and also a love for the signs that need to be continued. If you're gonna be sitting in your grandmother's chair, they still, you know, there's something that still feels relevant and not out of place. And that's what I try to achieve always with design. Well, I feel that um, the, your approach, I would say, is quite un-New Yorkan, where everything has to be new. Um, and I also feel that you, you stand for a certain sophisticated, quiet, and well-made clothes with a sustainable edge. Would you yourself describe it like that? There is a little sustainability, isn't it, of what you do? There's a lot um, of that. Um, we call it honest luxury 
basically my principles for design is buying the best materials that are, are available. I'm, I'm, I'm just too old to, I just want to work with the best things I can find and then work with the best craftsmanship because when you're working with the best craftsmanship, you're basically supporting passion because it's usually our suppliers from the mills or, or the factories, they are, they've been doing this for multi-generations and it takes sometimes more than a lifetime and I know Portuguese people know that, to, to get some, some of those things right. So working with this craftsmanship, with the best materials, when it comes to design, if we're paying a premium price because we're working with top materials, I want to make sure that the design will last as well. So when our customer is buying a cashmere coat, a suit, or a dress, I want it to have it in their closet for the rest of their life. And I, I, my dream is always to be a hand-me-down to the children. A kind of slow fashion, you make it sound very beautiful. Yeah. Um, Carla, you've also spent a lot of time in New York, and of course now you're in Mexico. How do you feel the concept of luxury differs between the US and Latin America, and also within Latin America? Are there, well I can ask this to both of you, are there very different attitudes to luxury in America in, um, and in South America? I think so. I think as Latin Americans, we love to travel in general. We're very curious. Um, it wasn't until a few years ago that we had all the luxury brands in Latin America. So when we traveled, we wanted to go to the best stores, the, but not only the best stores, the best restaurants, the best museums. I think we have a curiosity that's, very, that's really great for luxury brands because we want to see what's out there. We want to go to the best places and really um, see what there is out there because not everything is available in our countries. Um, in my experience in Mexico, just in the past three years since I've lived there, you know, we've had so many openings of stores that we didn't have before. You know, Chanel opened up a few years ago. Just this year, Dior is opening one of their biggest stores in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Montclair is coming into the market for the first time. Loewe is opening up their first store. So there's so much that we can now find available in Mexico, whereas before, people from Mexico, and I know a lot of people from Panama and Colombia and Argentina were doing um, shopping trips to the US and to Europe, but now you don't have to go anywhere. You can buy it at home, and a lot of the online retailers are making it easier to ship into our countries, which I think is great. What I do wish is that we could support more brands like Gabriela that you know, are doing things and are people from our region. I think we have a lot of, of work to do um, with people that are doing you know, sustainable fashion and really are um, working with local artisans and you, Gabriela, that are working with, you know, have Merino in your family. And I think that's also something important and that we need to focus on. And um, well, Gabriela, you're um, opening a store now in yes. New York, can't you? Tell us about that. Uh, so we are opening um, in November, hopefully October. <laughs> Our store, it's on Madison Avenue, it's next to the Carlisle. It has two doors to Madison and one that connects to the Carlisle so you can shop and have a martini. Um, but it's not only our first flagship, but it's, always, it's also going to be the first store that you can buy our handbag collection. That it's, uh, we don't wholesale it, we have kept the distribution to ourselves. So it, it, we have a product that has a demand, so we, we felt it was really important that we opened the store, not only for the handbags, but also to see the whole breadth of the collection of what we do, because um, it's outerwear, blankets, ready to wear, it's, it's uh, quite complete, so that you can see the quality and the craftsmanship at the touch. I pay a lot of uh, attention to the psychology of touch and how women feel with uh, what, what's next to their skin, so I think that's a place where they can experience it. You are being very humble about your bags. Just in, in case there are any bag makers out there, this is somebody who makes bags that are so desirable that she doesn't advertise them anywhere. She doesn't put them into any stores, well, except maybe your new one. And people are just rushing after and begging for them. What's the secret? <laughs> Well, the secret is that it's not my first time in the rodeo. Um, and I knew when I had the handbags um, that there was a desirability when, when, when it started to happen. And I realized we had all the stores in the world wanting to carry it. And, and I decided to say no, because yes, we can, you can have a handbag that's a hit. And uh, you have it for two years, your revenue goes up the roof, and then what else? So you have to make sure that you keep a longevity and a long point of view and I decided that that's what we needed to keep. So we're very mindful about how we distribute things and overexposure 
and in there's this world that everything is available in a click of a button, I think it creates this communication with the customer and a longing to, to wait for the handbag, to have it, the surprise, the pleasure, the human part of it. I think Carla wants to yes, talk so about something Yes, so last year, um, speaking of the bags and waiting lists and waiting to get them, last year you donated all the proceeds from the sale of your handbags for one week on Federico Marchetti's Neta Porte and Bergdorf Goodman to save the children. You also work with a women's cooperative in Uruguay. Why does philanthropy play such a big role in your business and I, in your life? I work with the Save the Children every year and Manos del Uruguay every season. Um, I, I am from the belief system that we're all interconnected much more than we appreciate. And um, I feel a sense of responsibility and, and of duty to serve other people. And um, I, I believe that with whatever spotlight you have, narrow or wide, you should use it to, to illuminate other people that don't, don't have that attention. And there's a lot of things that concern me, and climate change is one of them, and especially how it's affecting now people that have the least. And in that case, on that, in that campaign was to bring attention to the drought that's been affecting 20 million people in Africa, and it's not getting in the news cycle. And it's, it's, the UN is calling it one of the biggest crises after the Second World War. And so I felt I had to do something. I went to Turkana, and immediately I was like thinking, what do I need to do? What do I have that's attention? And so we did this, this, um, this collaboration with Nea Porte and Bergdorf, and it was extremely successful, and I felt very lucky for my team. And I, that not only we could contribute with a monetary donation, but also that we were able to bring awareness to something that needs, a, needs attention. So, so yes, it's a great platform to have to be able to, to use this to connect and, and try to help. You, you always seem very smart on the business side, and I mean, that it's all thought through. But of course, you do have your husband, Austin Hurst, who it seems to be very, um, I won't say he's in control, but he's very much got a vision um, of how you can develop a company. Um, do you want to be recognized for producing discrete modern versions of luxury to sell throughout Europe and America and who knows, maybe this country. Is, is that your aim? Well, uh, yes, to, to the two points. Um, you know, it was, it's, with, regarding my husband, it was, it's a kind of weird, but I always had these dreams. He was a kid that I wanted to, to work and collaborate with my, with my partner. And Austin and I have such different backgrounds. Um, but we have one thing in common, that we both were raised by, by women that love horses and the outdoors. So we were both riding horses since we, are, we have no conscience, we don't remember. But when you're a little kid riding a big animal, um, that gives you a certain inner confidence and we share that. And then he also has a lot of courage in taking uh, risk uh, and business decisions and also great marketing and communications idea. And because he grew up in this corporate environment, as we grow, he knows exactly what stage we should implement what structure. And then for us, I think as a company, I want to be able to keep on creating products as we see ourselves as a lifestyle brand, um, luxury brand that's made with the best quality. And we are always obviously thinking of the environment because I don't think luxury should be wasteful. I think, and that comes from, the, from my countryside view that wants to, needs to be measured on how we use the materials. And, and keep on giving this, this uh, experience to the customer that they don't need to worry we've taken care of making sure that this product has a conscience and, and a thought process that's fulfilled. Now, uh, Cara, what, what do you think that this would work? Perhaps that's not the right word, but I mean, are um, people in um, Latin America in general, do they, is it very thoughtful? Do people think a lot about where their um, clothes come from, where the cloth think, comes from? I think more and more people are, are thinking about it. I mean. In general, just due to what's going on in the political climate in Mexico, particularly, you know, people really are now looking to buy things in Mexico to make sure that they know where everything is coming from, to support the local artisans that have been working in Mexico and all around Latin America, because a lot of the times what happens is Europeans come and they see it and they say, oh, I want to create a brand with, you know, a local Mexican artisan, and that's when the world sees it. And I feel like people are realizing that we need to be investing in these people and we need to be supporting our own artisans and those people we, that... We meaning your country. Yes, my country. Have a, and Should and, have a plan for 
helping people and the consumers. Who are artisans, yes. You know, I think it's important to educate, for example, our readers um, in Vogue, just supporting the local designers that are in Mexico and doing things in Mexico that are doing things in Colombia, because once we start talking about it, you know, we want to be able to give them this platform to really for the world to see, and I think that that's. Um, part of our job in editorial is to you know, support people, the designers that are doing things there, people that are doing things locally, and um, you know, artisans, for example, in Argentina that have been making leather boots for the polo teams you know, forever that you see you know, that brands like Jager Le Cult are recognizing. You know, I think it's important for us to recognize it so that other people can see what's, what's happening, and I think um, this is also to do with social responsibility in general and the environment and where things come from and, you know, giving credit to, to those that deserve it. Uh, and what about you, Gabriella? Have you tried um, to sell your products to Uruguay, Uruguay or the wider um, Latin American area? Have you approached them? We haven't strategically tried to target the, the area as we, as we, our growth is, it's, we are specific of how we're doing it, and, but we're shipping uh, international, we ship to more than 52 countries worldwide, and so obviously we, we cater to the customers that uh, buy from us directly. But we do see um, potential, obviously, in, in both in, in Mexico and in Brazil, and um, for a brand like us. But I, in a country like Uruguay, to talk to about my specific country, it's a very small market. It's only 3.5 million people, and they have a high taxes. So import duties are 50 percent. So there's not a lot of luxury brands that enter beside being the iconic watch brand or, or car and some presence in beauty. And, but that doesn't mean that they don't understand quality because if you buy a sweater from Manos del Uruguay, it will last you a, a long time. So they, they consume actually quality, as you say, that's this crafted. Right. They just consume luxury in a, in a different way. How would you describe this luxury consumer in Uruguay? Like, do you feel like it's more you know, they'll buy like a cashmere sweater and give it... They will buy mostly a merino sweater, <laughs> but <laughs> they, good for me. Um, but the, the, the actual customer does travel, the one that, that and uh, you have to understand this about Uruguay. We have the widest middle class in South America after Chile. It's actually 62% of the population is middle class. So, but there's no extreme wealth because we are an agriculture economy. So it, it's more of, I, of this dynamic of you, you don't see too much uh, brand as a, as a status symbol. So there are certain elements, but there's not a strong presence of that. Um, but there is the, the nicest thing you could do when I was growing up was you bought your European fabrics, um, and then you would have your seamstress make your design. Right. So essentially, we were using couture. So, but it was done in this way that it was a very precious, and you wouldn't have a lot of clothes. You would have you know, a, a nice uh, amount that would last you for a long time. Yeah, that I feel like hasn't changed much. The, the, yeah. the idea and, you know, growing up with Mexican parents, you, you always seem to value the European as the, you know, true luxury and what you're saying is buying fabrics and having someone do it there. Yeah. Well, you're speaking two languages and it seems to be working really well. I wonder if anyone, has anybody asked to, um, a, a question that we can hear? I have two submitted questions, one for Carla and one for Gabriella, so I will start with, with Carla. Um, we have a question that uh, asks you, how does your experience in Mexico compare to your time in New York? Do people in Mexico consume media differently? Oh, yes. Um, well, I grew up in, actually in the U.S. My parents are Mexican, um, but they moved to America when, well, when we were born. And it's just completely different. I mean, even in the past three years since I've, I've moved to Mexico, you've seen the difference, as I was saying, you know, from, from three years ago that I moved there, just, you know, now there's, there were five local brands that people are talking about, now there's 20. I think um, in the past year, we've become really, we kind of took this moment to be introspective and really support our own country and our own culture. And maybe instead of buying, you know, the, Prada bag in Dallas, you buy it in Mexico because you want to support, you know, the designers that are investing in your country. Um, in terms of, of media, it's, I mean, the landscape is, is really different. I think what's really exciting right now is that, you know, as opposed to five years ago when I was living in New York and an editor at W, um, 
you didn't, you, you had to really pick up the, the international editions of Condé Nast or whatever magazine you bought. And now, you know, you have people on the other side of the world saying, oh, I saw your cover, you know, the day it comes out and it looks amazing. And, and I think that is making, you know, the world so much smaller. And it's, I think in the past, Latin America has maybe been a little bit overlooked. And I think um, now that just with social media and everyone kind of talking and always, you know, having things instantly that you can see, I think, you know, it's a time to celebrate really the region, the culture, and, and I think it's actually my responsibility as um, an editor to really promote what's going on, um, not just in Mexico, but in Latin America as a whole. And there's so many countries and so many places to visit that I have my hands full. <laughs> Thank you so much. And there's another question? The Gabriella, yeah, the Gabriella question is, how will you, Gabriella, address the need for storytelling and experience on a retail level with your new store and bring the story of your brand to life? Well, that, that is the great opportunity that we're looking into, into, the, into building the store because you, you're, you're not able to express too much, you know, when you have two or three racks at Bergdorf Kaufmann. But when I'm going to be able to express my taste architecturally, the elements that are structured, so the story is going to be there. It's usually the same um, theme that goes across me, which is a, a use of materials, of things that make you look, but not calling your attention too much. It's on the second take that you really see the depth of, of what we're trying to say. Well, that's a beautiful answer to a beautiful collection. Thank you so Thank you. much. And time for tea. Thank you.